Well, thank you all very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, I don't always come and talk about my, you know, the housing forecast that I do focuses on single family housing. It's, it's, it's in, and especially thinking about the owner occupied market, although there's not necessarily a restriction, you know, when somebody goes and works with a realtor to buy a house, they could easily be an investor. But I actually built into here some other discussion because the owner occupied market and the renter occupied market the single family, the two to four family, the multifamily, all of those markets interact with each other. And so I'm gonna talk about some of those pieces and some of the things we hear see happening today. Um, I have copies of our forecasts that are at your um, tables there and you're welcome to have those. Special thanks to Security First Title and Meritrust. They've been longtime partners with us and make it possible for us to do that. And also a thanks to the Kansas Association of Realtors and all the realtor boards, including the Realtor of South Central Kansas. We actually prepare the monthly statistical reports that go out in the press releases for all of the local boards across the state, not just Wichita, but across the state of Kansas. And that's through a contract and a partnership that we have with the Kansas Association. And from our standpoint, that benefits us because we are able to have access to the data to do our forecast. Um, when I've been doing my forecast presentations this year, it's been a lot more economics than it has been housing markets. And that's because we are in a very interesting time right now. And people seem to be more interested in the economics. And that's why when Craig said, you know, how much time do you want? I said, how much time will you give me? Because <laughs> there's a lot to talk about here. But, you know, one of those questions that we've, we've had is, are we in a recession, right? You hear people talking about that. And my very quick answer to that is not now, but maybe soon, okay? Um, one of the reasons people are saying, oh, we're in a recession is because gross domestic product growth, GDP growth, you may have all learned in your high, in your high school or college economics class, oh, the definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters <laughs> of negative GDP growth. We're producing less then we did the previous quarter. If we do that twice in a row, that's a recession. Well, that may be a working rule of thumb sometimes, but it is not the formal definition of a recession. It turns out the formal definition of a recession is extremely fuzzy. It's a little bit like that definition of pornography. Well, I can't really tell you what it is, but we know it when we see it. Right? And so the recessions are defined. And by the way, on any of my slides here, um, the dark blue shaded regions are official dates of recessions. And those are decided by a group called the Recession Dating Committee of the National Bureau of Economic Research. And it's a group of a committee of private economists that get together, most of them academics, and they look at all sorts of different data about the economy. And they will then try and say, here's when a recession began, here's when it ended. And their goal is to be definitive. They want to be accurate. They don't necessarily care if they're timely. So if we are in a recession right now, they won't tell us for probably a year or more from now. Okay? They will wait to see how things go. And then they will say, yes, here's the date that it started. Here's the date that it ended. Okay? One of the things that I said is, is those two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth, which we did have, were really, really modest declines. And the most recent quarter, the third quarter number, actually came out with a positive number. So this, this on its own would be unlikely uh, to indicate. By the way, you go back to the 2001 recession there, and you can see where um, we actually had one quarter negative, another quarter positive, another quarter negative. It, that two consecutive quarters isn't always the rule that they use. Much more likely they are to look at what's happening with employment, what's happening in the jobs market. And so this is a little bit of a strange picture. This is the official <coughs> employment figures for Wichita, Kansas, and the United States. But I have normalized it to the beginning of 2020, just prior to the onset of the pandemic. And what you can see is that we had job growth. So it went from zero down for Wichita, dropped down to minus 14 and a half. That meant that between January 
and I think it was July of 2020, we lost 14.5% of our payroll employment in Wichita over that period of time. Very steep, sharp decline because of the pandemic layoffs. You can see the recession. They said, yes, we are in a recession, but it was a very short recession. And since then, we've been recovering. And the two things I want to show here is that the teal line is the United States. US total employment is now above where it was prior to the onset of the pandemic, and the growth has been pretty strong. That level of employment growth is not consistent with what we would say we're in a recession. Wichita and Kansas, we're still struggling. We're down a little over 3% compared to where we were at the start of the pandemic. So we have not recovered all of our jobs yet. And it, you can tell our growth rate has been pretty sluggish as well. Um, come on, we can do that. There we go. Um, the Center for Economic Development Business Research, Jeremy Hill, puts out an annual employment forecast. And this year, when they did their forecast, they decided to do both an optimistic and a pessimistic forecast because there's so much uncertainty about what's going on. The numbers that I have here are their optimistic forecast. Now, this is for Wichita. 2022 numbers are pretty much baked in. There's nothing that could really change that would make a big difference there. You know, we might be 301,000, we might be 301,500, we might be 300, 500, you know, just a little bit of change around there, but that's pretty baked in. Where their forecast differs is based on um, what happens in next year and the following year. And in their pessimistic forecast, they have that in a, in a bad scenario for Wichita, employment will be basically flat, no growth, instead of the 1.1% that they have projected. And then if that happens, their projection is that 2024 is better than what they forecast here. So their, their negative forecast is one where we're, we don't see the growth next year, it's delayed until the following year. All of that's consistent with the idea that to the extent that we have a recession, it would be relatively mild. That's, that's the projection that we have there. The other thing that really is just not consistent with saying we're in a recession is the unemployment rate. And unemployment rates, nationwide, Kansas, Wichita, at historic lows, the lowest levels in Kansas that we've ever seen since I think the late 1990s, really, really, really low unemployment rates. And it's just not consistent to say everybody who wants a job, who has a job, who wants a job has one to say that we're in a recession. Now, nationwide, we've begun to see that tick up a little bit. We've seen lots of announcements of these mass layoffs at some of the high tech companies and so forth. But that still hasn't, I mean, these data are pretty high frequency. And, and so, you know, just because you see the big headlines of those big, big changes, that doesn't mean that they're just sitting there unemployed. These are people very frequently that have a lot of opportunities. And so we're not yet seeing that translate in. So if that's the case, if the labor market is doing really well and the GDP growth is kind of just bouncing around, why are people saying we're going to enter a recession? Well, a big part of that is because of what's been going on with the Federal Reserve. And the Fed has been driving up short-term interest rates, their Fed funds rate, very aggressively in response to inflation, which we'll talk about here in a moment. And, and one thing that we look at, so this yield curve is kind of a strange thing. It's what we're doing is we're looking at what does the federal government have to pay to borrow money for different lengths of time? The three-month interest rate, the one-year Treasury security rate, the five-year and the 10-year. So we're looking at longer term, do people pay, does the federal government have to pay more to borrow for the long term, or do they pay more to borrow in the short term? Ordinarily, we, ex we call this the yield curve, and we expect that longer term interest rates are higher than short term interest rates. After all, if you wanted to get a 15-year mortgage, you expect to get a better interest rate than with a 30-year mortgage, right? Why? Because there's more risk with a longer-term investment than there is a short-term investment. When we see the yield curve invert, 
you can see here that the 10-year treasury right now, the blue line at the top is right now, by the way, the orange line at the bottom is roughly one year ago, and the teal line in the middle is six months ago. So I tried to take these three points in time. And so the 10-year treasury is just over 4%, but the uh, one-year treasury is up close to 4.5%. So there's this, this decline that it's cheap, cheaper to borrow money for the federal government for 10 years than it is for one year. And that often is used as a predictor. Many, many people will say that's a predictor of future recessions. I would argue it's not a predictor of future recessions. It's a predictor that markets believe interest rates will be, short-term interest rates will be lower in the future. After all, why would you lend money to the federal government at 4% if you thought that the one-year rate was going to stay at 4.75% for the next 10 years? You could just invest into, uh, buy a one-year treasury, get 4.75%, then roll it into the next one at 4.75%, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. The only way this makes sense with financial markets, who are not stupid, right, is that they are expecting that the one-year treasury rate will be lower over the next 10 years, so that on average, I make the same amount of money either way I go, whether investing in short term over 10 years or just locking it all up for 10 years. Now, one reason short-term interest rates could fall in the future is because we go into recession. The Fed would be then be fighting a recession, they'd lower short-term interest rates. But another reason could be that they're expecting inflation to get under control. And so as a result, rates could come down for that reason. So in thinking about inflation here, again, I, I think it's helpful in the in current environment to think, you know, kind of look at a long-term perspective, because what's been going on the last two years is very unusual. And so I have two, two lines on here. Sorry, this, I'm an economist by training. I see these squiggly lines. It just makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. <laughs> Most people, I know, it's just your eyes glaze over. It's like, oh man, that professor who just droned on and on. My, if I ever go by a slide and I don't tell you the picture that I'm seeing, stop me because I'm not doing my job. Okay? My job is to show you the pictures and the reason I feel all warm and fuzzy looking at this. So there are two lines on this. It goes all the way back to 1960. The dark purple line is the headline inflation number that we all see in the news reports. Okay? The orange line is what I've labeled as core inflation. But what it really is, is it's, in, it's the headline inflation number where they've pulled out food prices and energy prices. Food and energy prices tend to be very volatile. You know, gasoline can go up or go down. Food prices, commodities can go up and go down. We call the, the consumer price index less food and energy core inflation. And in some sense, it's a way of thinking about do the under, do changes in are they broad based or is it all being driven by these volatile components? Okay. If you go back into history here, I, by the way, I forgot to mention these slides are on my website right now. If you go to realestate.wichita.edu, right on the homepage, you should see the IRAM presentation uh, and a link to that so that you can download these slides. Um, you'll notice that traditionally what happens is that as as consumer inflation goes up, core inflation kind of trails it, typically. You'll see overall inflation, but then they move in lockstep just slightly behind. Especially look here by 1975. See how we saw that. The energy crisis go up, in, prices went up, and then other things, less food and energy, followed it maybe six, you know, three to six months later. Okay? And that's a pretty typical pattern until we got into the 2000s. And then notice we started seeing all this. First of all, we were at a point of very low inflation, right? Overall inflation was averaging maybe 2 3%. But notice that the purple line would go up and down, and the orange line wouldn't move as much. It wasn't moving. And my favorite example of that was back in 2008 and 2009. Do you remember what happened in 2008? 
oh, the world was going to collapse. Gasoline prices topped $4 a gallon here locally, right? And we had this big inflation. Inflation was above 5%. Oh, terrified. Core inflation really didn't move. It was all energy prices that was driving that. And then the following year, when gas prices dropped back down below $2 a gallon, we had negative headline inflation for the first time since the 1950s. Okay? So we'd kind of, this, this relationship, we had had very steady, persistent, unchanging inflation, core inflation, even as we saw thing, the headline number bounce around. Okay? That continued until this most recent bout of inflation, where it seems like we've kind of gone back to that, uh, uh, that trend that we had in the past. And that's part of what the Fed is concerned about. The Fed is concerned, do we get to a place where, because we see some changes in inflation, we expect that that's going to continue or even accelerate in the future? And that's why the Fed has been very aggressive in trying to deal with this after being a little bit late to the <clears> game initially. Um, so um, let me go back to inflation and just talk about a couple other things with inflation here. What causes and what drives inflation? We have lots of different theories and stories, all of which are right and none of which are complete about what drives inflation. Milton Friedman once said, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, meaning that we have too much money chasing too few goods, and that's what leads to inflation. And he's absolutely right. But you can also think about a Keynesian perspective where you have some notion of aggregate demand and aggregate supply. And one of the things that captures here, I think, where this inflation initially started to tick up. It was the supply chain issues that we had. And those supply chain issues were really analogous to a negative supply shock. We had this demand for goods and services that we could not satisfy. And so that ended up simultaneously reducing our output the production that we could have, and increasing the prices of goods and services because of that reduction in the supply chain problems. When the Fed was talking about inflation as transitory, that's what they were really addressing. And I was on board with that at the time. This view that the inflation that we're seeing is due to these supply chain shocks, and they weren't going to try and address that for two reasons. Number one, there's not squat the Fed can do about supply chain issues. They really can't. They have no policy mechanisms by which they can fix supply chain problems. And number two, they had a strong belief that we would go back, you know, oh, we saw this temporary spike where it went up because of the supply chain issues. Those supply chain issues will resolve as we move past the pandemic. And as a result, then the prices will come back down and so there's nothing that we needed to do, even if there was something that we could do, which there isn't, so we can't. Then we got hit with the war in the Ukraine, which was another supply shock. It impacted commodities, both, both food prices and energy prices, in a, in a more fundamental way because of the world nature of those markets. So we got a second supply shock that made it worse. That's all supply side issues. But there was also a demand side issue. And this is one that the Fed did not anticipate as well as they should have, nor did I. I mean, I, I was 100% on board with the way the Fed was looking at it a year ago. Um, in the face of the pandemic, the federal government went very aggressive in trying to provide economic stimulus to the general economy to prevent a very severe economic downturn from resulting. Well, when that all really began to hit the system and move into things, that coupled with the supply chain issues created a really big demand shock. And that's a thing that the Fed can control, right? The Fed's interest rate movements are really intended to dampen demand. 
It's really intended to reduce the amount of desire for goods and services by consumers, by businesses, by making it more costly to do that. And so once they realized that that demand side of things was in there, they began to work very aggressively. And their fear was that those two things together, the supply shocks and the demand shocks, are what caused inflation to really skyrocket really fast. And because that went up in core inflation here, the concern and the fear is that that would then become embedded. We then begin to have inflation because we expect to have inflation. We write it into our contracts. We, in our lease agreements, we write in steps anticipating that um, rents are going, you know, that inflation is going to be there and it's going to be five, six percent. So we build in these increases in our long term leases. And that then makes it become this self fulfilling prophecy. Does that make sense? And there are all sorts of contracts in the economy where that can happen. The Fed was trying to get ahead of that. My personal belief is that the Fed, I don't know if it's a belief or a hope. It's somewhere between those two things. The Fed is doing more saber rattling than they are sincerely going to keep moving interest rates up. I expect, this is my own personal expectation, that there will be one more interest rate increase this year and that it will be a much more modest increase. And then they're going to put it in a holding pattern for, I think, at least six months. Why? because it takes a long time for the interest rate changes that the Fed does to actually really begin to be felt through the economy. They know this, but again, they're worried about expectations getting set. And that's why I think they're being more aggressive in their rhetoric than they necessarily intend to follow through on. Does that make sense? So, um, going to try and keep in here. I'm going to go relatively short on my uh, single family housing market side of things because I thought you all would be more interested in some of this stuff. And I want to get to how, how the inter single family works with, with um, the uh, multifamily. The thing that I want to say about mortgage rates and what's going to happen with mortgage rates is that mortgage rates are based less on actual inflation than expected inflation. We don't care about where the inflation number is right now. We care about where inflation will be over the next 30 years if we're talking about a 30-year fixed mortgage rate. And so on this line, I have three numbers. The purple line at the top is the headline inflation number. And you can see we've started to see that inflation come back down. That's actually a really positive sign, back down below 8%. Who would have thought that we would have said 7.8% inflation was a good number, right? But, but there we are. We're happy with that one right now. But, but that's headline inflation. That's where we've been over the past year. What do we expect? Well, well, the University of Michigan does a survey of households, and they ask, what do you think inflation will be over the coming year? And right now, their expected inflation is like 4.75%. It's, it's, you know, they expect inflation to be lower than it is, but still much higher than the Fed's inflation target, which is around 2%. But the third line, the orange line on there, is a very interesting number. It's what we call the five-year break-even rate. And it is a measure in, inferred, a measure of expected inflation that's based on financial markets. And what, so a traditional treasury security, you would lend money, let's say, for five years to the federal government. And you'd take out this $1,000 bond, and then you would give the federal government the $1,000. They would pay you interest on that bond every six months. And then at the end of five years, they'd pay you back your $1,000 in principal. That's the way treasury securities typically work. There's an alternative treasury security called a TIPS security, Treasury Inflation Protected Security, T-I-P-S tips. Those tips securities, at the end of each year, same thing, you give the government $1,000, they then uh, give you semi-annual interest, so every six months they give you the interest on that bond, but at the end of the year they go and they say, well, we just had an 8% inflation last year, 
So that means we're going to increase the face value of this bond, the principal amount, by 8% to compensate you for actual inflation that occurred. So we're going to increase that face value of the bond. Now it's $1,080 rather than $1,000. That's used to calculate your interest for the next year. And then they'll do it again at the second year, the third year, the fourth year, and the fifth year. Because that bond, every year you get, a, you get compensated for actual inflation that occurred, the interest rate can be lower because you don't have to build in an inflation premium into the interest rate. The difference between a traditional treasury security and the TIPS security, with a little bit of you know, mathematical things going on with it, but basically that five-year break-even rate is what financial markets are saying the implicit inflation premium is on the regular treasury securities. In other words, it's what the bettors who are betting literally tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars in these financial markets, it's what they're saying they think inflation will be over the next five years, the collective wisdom of financial markets. And that number has steadily come down this year and now is sitting at about 2.4%. Okay? That's very close to the Fed's inflation target, which this is my preferred measure of expected inflation. I think that builds into what we're seeing with mortgage rates. And it is, I think it's what gives me more confidence than hope that the Fed is going to taper its, slow down its activities in terms of raising interest rates uh, by the beginning of the year. So with that, that leads us to, um, I won't talk much about the Fed's tapering of, of quantitative easing and things. MBA mortgage rates forecast. This is the Mortgage Bankers Association's forecast for the 30-year fixed mortgage rate. They're forecasting that it's going to go down to 4.5% by the end of 2024. Um, you know, that's a pretty substantial decline. The only way that happens is if inflation does get back down. I personally think that that's the lowest it could possibly go. I, I'm pretty confident we will never see interest rates down in the 3% range again. And that's all because the reason we saw those interest rates in the 3% range is because the Federal Reserve was so aggressive in buying mortgage-backed securities. They've begun, you can see the very top line tapering at the end, they've begun to start letting those mortgage-backed securities roll off their balance sheets, but they're just not, they're not going and selling them. They're just, as they mature, as they pay off, they're letting those mortgage-backed securities roll away. And so as a result, interest mortgage rates will end up going lower if inflation gets under control than I think would be normal because the Fed has so much aggressive involvement in the mortgage-backed security market. Whew. Let me take a quick pause. And that was a lot, really fast. Questions, comments? Yes, so um, obviously China had a lot to do with it, right, with COVID and supply chain. Um, and it makes me concerned with their zero COVID policy about how right. long will these supply chain and issues continue. Right. Uh, I mean, they locked down 100 million at a time. I mean, you see the anecdotes, mm -hmm. Disneyland, Shanghai, mm -hmm. shut down, everybody's stuck inside Ikea's. Do you have a concern once China, once this zero COVID policy goes away, production comes back on, and now obviously the equilibrium shifts where there's just gonna be oversupply, right? Catching up, and there's gonna be less demand. Do you see? Well, you know, certainly that, I mean, but that's a good thing for prices, right? Well, so to the extent that we see that, now. yeah, and so, I think one of the challenges that we have is that, you know, it, it is like running a, a, a truck down the highway, right? Or think about a, a traffic jam, right? You know, you have an accident on a highway and it backs up cars for two miles or something. And by the time you get there and you go through that and, the, and everything's cleared out, you're going, what on earth was everybody slowed down for? The, car, the, the accident had been cleared you know, two hours ago, but the cars are still slowed down and do that. So even if China sort of ended their you know, their zero COVID policy tomorrow, and they started full bore on production, 
there's still every step through that supply chain process that you know you've only got so many you know tanker you know so many ships the cargo ships that are able to take things back and forth you've only got so much port capacity you've only got it, it will take time for all of that to really get back to where traffic is flowing normal again and i will tell you just my own personal hope with this is that you know there had been such a big push to um, you know just in time manufacturing right you know where where you have the product that you need right when you need it you don't carry inventories on your shelves you don't do these things and very frequently it was what is the lowest cost producer that we can get i'm hopeful that businesses are really rethinking their supply chain process and asking how do i have multiple vendors so that i don't if something happens with one vendor that i'm not completely hung up they've they've, they've seen the challenges that they have with that and also diversifying across across countries, across sources of vendors. And I think you see that going to Vietnam, right? They right. A lot of it. And, and, and to different countries. And also, I think we're seeing some reshoring of different things depending on that. So I think that's all healthy and good, but it does take a lot of time. That doesn't happen just overnight. Could you see this swing into deflation? If there's a radical swing that we had in inflation, right? Can you see that resulting in deflation? Deflation. Again, it depends on what you mean by deflation. If it's just a situation where we have consumer price index falls over the course of a year, yes. That's not what I think of when I think of deflation. And this would get into a whole different story of, 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 of deflation. Deflationary spiral uh, becomes this situation where people actually sort of remove from the market because they're expecting prices to be lower in the future. And so they defer and they delay purchases and it, and it becomes this sort of everything sort of grinds down into a halt. I think that's unlikely, but I've always thought that I, I've been less concerned about deflationary spirals than other people are, because at the end of the day, we all want the goods and services that we want and we need. And so I, I do think I, I'm a believer in that insatiable, de insatiable demand for consumption at some point. Um, but I could be proven wrong. I've been proven wrong in the past. Um, I, I'm more sanguine about that process taking enough time for that to, to smooth and work out. So, um, home sales activity have definitely tailed off over the course of this year. Um, that, I would argue, is a combination of both a demand-driven influence and a supply-driven influence. We were facing real supply shortages even prior to the increases in mortgage rates over the course of this year. And I'll show you some pictures that talk about that. Again, this is home, again, I went all the way back to 2001. I've gone back as far as I can on some of these pictures to give you a sense of kind of longer term trends and where we've been. Um, one thing that I want you to notice on here is, is look at the really sharp increase in home sales that we we've been flat here for several years prior to the pandemic and then we jumped up here in 2020 and 2021 and that was driven by a lot of the policy responses to the pandemic but the supply constraints were still there um, i'll just i'll mention our forecast was for a 4.9 percent decrease this year that's not going to happen we're going to be down closer to 10% this year in terms of home sales activity this year, just where we are year to date. Um, our forecast is essentially flat for next year. I'm going to hold less to my number that I had there than I am to that, that flat. Not a big increase, not a big decline. So why do I think that the issue is more supply driven than demand driven? Well, again, historical perspective, I think, is really, really helpful here. So this is the number of active listings in the Wichita MLS system going back to 2001. And you can see that we never really saw this huge increase in active listings in 2009, 2010 in the face of the downturn from the housing crisis, the financial crisis that we had back then. Little bit of an increase as, as we went into kind of resolving things, but we had a lot of active listings that were there with strong home sales. 
And then follow, as we recovered from the financial crisis, really starting in 2011, we've just been whittling away our active listings. We have been selling more homes than we've been adding to the market for a long time. And before we entered the pandemic in 2019, we ended 2019 with around 2,000 homes, which is about half of what we had back in 2012. Okay? So that's a very, very sharp decline in inventories. Other ways we could think about these changes in inventories. Um, how, much, how much bargaining power do buyers and sellers have? So this is what percentage of homes are selling at a discount from their original list price. And again, I went all the way back to 2000 to give some perspective with this. Back in 2000, and for all those 2000s, we were sitting around 60% of homes sold at a discount, which meant that 40% of homes sold at or above the list price, okay? In the wake of the financial crisis, after that downturn, clearly we moved into what was a buyer's market, and only and 80% of homes sold at a discount, as opposed to the 60% we had previously. Prior to the pandemic, we'd worked our way back down to that 60% that we had for a long time previously, but then during the pandemic, it just plummeted as, as the seller's market became so strong. If we had 40% of homes selling at a discount, that meant that 60%, more than half of all homes, sold at or above the original price that they listed when they put it on the market. That's enormously tight. And although you can see that starting to turn up, and we hear stories from realtors that are consistent with that, here's what they're saying. In the spring, I'd put a home on the market. I would have 15 offers all above list price in a matter of 24 or 48 hours. Now I'm putting it on the market and I'm getting five offers at or above list price, or maybe some right below list price within the first week. If you took away the past two years, especially the, you know, the between 2021 and 2022, if you took that away, everybody would be saying, this is a not so crazy housing market, okay? It's, it's incredibly tight. You don't normally see that kind of strong, strong demand, uh, you know, multiple offers over list price. So even though it's less than what it was, it's still very, very tight. And one other picture is just how long does it take to sell a home? Again, median days on market. You go back to 2003, 40 days was the typical time to sell a home in Wichita. Again, it went up when we were in a real buyer's market after the financial crisis, but that's been steadily coming down. Prior to the pandemic, it was about 20 days and it dropped down where people were talking about hours on market, not days on market. And so that we measure balance in the housing market with this number we call month supply. And I'm gonna give you your time, Craig. I'm gonna give you your time. Um, we call month supply. Um, we generally think of a balanced market as being between a four and six month supply. Wichita hadn't been there since 2014 as a balanced market. And so we're still, even though month supply has been coming up, going from a 0.6 month supply to a 0.8 month supply is still, now, now we're above one, we're, we're about a 1.5 1, 1 month supply. That's still, any other time other than the past two years, we would have said this is just, it's not possible for it to be tighter than this. So that has led to really, really sharp home price increases. By the way, this is not particularly unique to Wichita or to Kansas. This supply constraint issue was true in many markets across the country. And so when you saw a really tight inventory coupled with all the pandemic stimulus, and I'll, I'll go into it another time as to why we had this big, big increase in housing demand during the pandemic. Um, it wasn't just moving out of big cities because it was, it was everywhere. That just lit a blowtorch to all the undergrowth that was the lack of inventory that we'd had prior to the pandemic, and that just caused a bonfire, a forest fire to happen in, in housing markets. And so as a result, home prices through the first half of this year went up 17% in Wichita. Unreal, 
Now that's coming down. We don't, I won't get the third quarter numbers until next week. And so, I, but I expect those will be substantially slower than they were in the first half of the year, but still strong. Um, our forecast is that we'll end the year at just under 13% for Wichita. Again, unreal number for home price appreciation. But that's down from 17 plus percent earlier in the year. And next year, our forecast is for home price appreciation to be at a more normal, typical pace. If you took out the last couple of years, 4.7% would be what we would call, wow, really strong, healthy, but strong home price appreciation for Wichita. And the reason I'm forecasting that, even in light of dampened demand, is we still don't have enough homes available for sale. And this is where I wanted to get to and where I'm gonna talk, because it's not just a single family home issue. Single family building permits, again, going back to 1995, in the wake of the pandemic, I'm sorry, in the wake of the financial crisis, new home construction just plummeted. And we never really recovered. We were sitting between, say, 2013 and 2018 at about 1,000 permits a year. We've jumped up now to about 1,500 permits a year, but that's still probably not enough to meet all the demand that we have here in the Wichita market. And it's this lack of building that has built a shortage that's caused what we're seeing in the existing home market. One of the things that's built that. Um, our forecast is for home, new home construction to be about the same over the next couple of years. When I sent this to Patrick Gobel over at Star Lumber, he said, I sure hope you're right. So here's the thing to know. The mortgage rate increase is clearly having an impact. We, we actually did this before the latest spike. We had to put this in before the latest spike in mortgage rates came up. We're clearly seeing an impact. My belief is that the impact that mortgage rates has is a little bit like when we walked out in the cold last week. It was the first time that it was cold, really cold that we'd had, and we put on our, 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 our warmest coats and our hats and our gloves and everything because it was a shock factor. But I, I had my coat here today. I looked at the weather. Oh, yeah, it's still pretty cold. I put it on and I got out and I, man, this, we could have had our meeting outside today. I mean, it, once we're used to it, we adapt. And the same thing is true with mortgage rates. Once people get used to it and adapt, a higher level of mortgage rates, you just, you find a way to make things happen. So I do believe that we may see, um, I think we'll hit that number. We may see a slight decline next year with that, but I think it's not going to be as big as, as some people fear because it, it, it will just be backloaded as people continue to build and they adjust to that. But the piece that I think is more interesting is how much of it could shift instead of being single family homes to two family homes. One way, <coughs> excuse me, one way that we adapt to the higher prices of home prices and the higher mortgage rates is to find ways to make things more affordable. And twin homes is a way that that can be done. Most of that building that we've seen here, and again, there's been, you see how that sharp, sharp increase? This is both single family permits and two family permits, duplexes added together. And we've seen a big increase in those two family permits, especially over the last few years. Most of that's in the rental market. You know, it's, it's whole subdivisions that have been developed for investors as rental properties. But the ability and the possibility of doing, in, in Lawrence, twin homes are a big segment of the market. And when you talk with realtors in Lawrence, for the owner occupied, that's the starter home, is a twin home where you have two houses, but it literally is divided lot. So it's not a single parcel, it's two parcels that share a wall. And that's a way to get into things that becomes a little bit more affordable and can manage that. And, and so that's something that I think is in some discussions as to how we can do that. And that could be some of those single family permits that I forecasted could end up really going more into the two family permits, but intended for owner occupancy. Okay, that, that would be the modification I might make. I then asked um, Jeff Englert over at um, 
NAI Martins. And, and so they just released their multifamily. And so these are all just in their multifamily report that they just put out. And you know, the number of apartment units that have been added, and, and one of the things they said is they were stunned at how few apartments were added in 2020, 2022. Some of that was supply chain issues and so forth. They, they are projecting nearly 800 new units are scheduled to come out and be on the market next year in terms of apartments. And when I, you know, one of the questions that I've been asking for a long time is when will we overbuild apartments? When will we overbuild apartments? Because that's just what developers do, right? There's demand for 4,000 new units, so five developers each add 1,000 units, and all of a sudden we add 5,000 units when there was only demand for 4,000, and so then we take a long time to absorb that, and that, that's a cycle that we have. And we kept thinking we'd have that here with all this new development, but rents, continue to, occupancies are still very, very good, right? We did not see a decline in occupancy rates. And when I, again, now, now this is where I say, all I do is I talk to all of you and then I repeat what you tell me, and then you think I'm smart. But how many of you are seeing difficulties with occupancy in your class B apartments? How many are seeing it in your class C apartments? How many are seeing rents that are stagnating in those? I thought that what may have been happening is that all these new apartments were being built, but, and it was just people moving into the flashiest, newest bling. And maybe things that maybe used to be class A, now they're sort of B plus, because they're just not quite as new and flashy. Maybe they were gonna start suffering. Everything I hear is that they're not. Are we gonna get there? We have to get there at some point in time. I would not personally be very excited about putting on all of this new inventory coming out in the coming year, um, but we haven't seen it yet. And one of the things that we see with this is that part of housing demand is household size. And average households have gotten smaller. Back at the beginning of 2000, this is nationwide data, it was 2.62. Uh, now it's 2.51. If you just go through, I have my numbers kind of on my cheat sheet over here. Um, Wichita MSA, we've got just under 650,000 people in the population. If you took that, so the number of people per household, you divide that into the population, that's how many housing units you will occupy. Okay, occupied housing units. Based on just that change of 2.62 people per household to 2.51, that would translate into an additional 11,000 occupied housing units in the Wichita metropolitan area, not taking into account population growth and not taking into account the demolition of older units that need to be moved out of the stock. And so all of that is, I think, part of what's been driving this demand. At what point will we outstrip it? That's a good question. We always do, but when is the question? So I took more time than I told you I'd take, but, but I hope it was worth it. So I'll let, thanks again to Security First Ameritrust, and I will hang around afterwards to answer questions so you all can do your installation of officers. So I'll leave it with that, and then we can continue more later.